Aloha. Hello. May I please speak to uh, Mr. Williams? This is he. Hey, how you doing? It's Dave Lawrence from Hawaii Public Radio. Hey, Dave. What's going on, man? Ah, it's great to hear your voice giving you a big hug and a high five. Huge, huge fan. So it's, Thank you uh, so much, man. The hug and the high five, five comes right back at <laughs> Can you hear me good? I can. Awesome. Today, uh, very exciting speaking with... And do you like to be Jimmy or James? James. James. They, they call me Diamond. That's right. Diamond Williams, Ohio Players drummer, joined during a... Uh, a critical period of the band, um, and then we're there for just a whole series of incredible records. Before we get into some of that history, Diamond, which is just going to be a treat to go over with you, I cannot say that enough, explain what first drew you to music as a child. Maybe share some of your early musical memories and perhaps give credit to some of the folks around you who helped instill the love for it at a young age. Wow. We'll start with, uh, I started playing around the house. My mom and dad suggested that it was around three or four years old. I would take pots and pans out of the cupboard <laughs> and start to bang on them with various rhythms and sounds <laughs> as she cooked in the kitchen or otherwise they would find me on the kitchen floor with pots and pans making noise. <laughs> but I have an early recollection of my dad and mom taking me to a parade. I don't know, have the occasion of knowing what holiday it might have been but it was a parade and i was like overwhelmed with the sound of the drums coming down the street and to see the power that drummers had over a crowd to just excite them just in drums and rhythms and people just starting to dance and throw bodies all over the place it's like oh my goodness what is going on here <laughs> it's like i've got to do that it's, you know it's something that i want to do it, I, I know what i want to do there's a story that would be part of my book where my mom told me i was around maybe seven or eight years old and my mom played all reeds coincidentally and i High school she played saxophone oboe bassoon clarinet she played all reeds and my dad was like um uh, i don't want to say like a frustrated musician but but he played drums a little bit and he had a great voice so music and jazz and that was all part of my growing up and my mother had a relative of hers that happened to be my uncle and he played double bass double string bass and he was getting ready to retire and my mother uh, she had told me she said you know your uncle wants to get rid of his string bass and she said you know um, when he comes over you know and he's going to ask you you know do you like music you of course you tell him yes and when he says what do you want to play you tell him string bass and you'll get to string bass you'll start taking string bass lessons you know and, and it'll be history this is what you're going to play this is the instrument and we went over that and several times you know we went over it during the week and she said well what are you going to play your uncle's here do you like music I said yes and what do you go what do you what, what would you like to play son would you like to play I said string bass Yes, that's the answer, son. So my uncle comes to the house. He, you know, starts talking in conversation. He said, you know, he said, Jimmy, I, I hear you like to play music. I said, yeah, I love music. I, I, you know, I want to play music. He said, what do you want to play? I said, drums. <laughs> my mother looked at me like, are you kidding me? And it was just something that I knew, even though I had been told and I had studied and, and tried to get it perfect as far as I was concerned. My words and my lines to this story I was supposed to tell, drums came out immediately. And uh, right after then, um, I, you know, I was in school presently, so I, I started to take drums in school. And then I took 12 years private lessons, went through the All City Orchestra and Band, and went to summer music workshops in the summer for two weeks at a college, Oxford University, Miami University. I got scholarships to that. I got a music scholarship to Kentucky State University and ended up at the University of, of, of Dayton. I had a love of drummers and music from the beginning that I can remember, as far back as I can remember. I mean, Gene Cooper and Buddy Rich and Louis Belsom and the guys that could just, just wail on drums and just play forever and had chops galore. And the list goes on and on as far as, you know, drummers that, that I really like. You know, a good friend of mine is Dennis Chambers and, and Buddy Miles. And, yeah, I mean, it just goes on and on. I, I, I'm going to stop because I don't want to leave anybody out. I will mention... <laughs> the fact of John Blackwell, who I hope it will be doing quite well 
uh, very soon is is a dear friend of mine, and he's an incredible drummer likewise, Prince's drummer, uh, and John Blackwell played with a lot of people. But um, So I had an appreciation and love for, for drums uh, as far back as I can remember. Um, the story, as we started out, I got in the band in 1972. The first album with, with me in the band was the Ecstasy album, oh. which was one album preceding the, the phonogram and Mercury days. But that's, that's how the story goes. That was after Pain? That was after Pain and Pleasure, and then was Ecstasy off the Westbound labels. Uh, Junie Morrison was my roommate when I got in the band, and I got a gold record for Funky Worm, not because I recorded it, but because I was the drummer out on the road promoting it. So I did get a gold record for that. I prominently placed it on my wall. It's one of my favorites, but um, it was I didn't record it. How did you first get the Ohio Players gig? Well, there's another story. Marvin Pierce, who was the trumpet player and played trombone in the band, both of us, in fact, Clarence Chet Willis, who's part of this band today, all three of us came from a band called The Overnight Low, which turned into a band called Sun. And this local band here. And The Overnight Low, Marvin Pierce being a part of it, and, and I mentioned Chet, Clarence, and some other guys, about five, six guys. We had a band. And he was the first one to leave out and, and get a job with the Ohio Players. They were looking for a horn section and to, to uh, strengthen up their horn section. And Marvin was able to go out and get a job. He had been working with them for about a year or so maybe a year, year and a half, and it come up on occasion that their drummer, who happened to be the, the leader of the band, his name is Greg Webster, he had gotten sick one weekend, uh, from, from what I heard. So he, Marvin called me and said, Jim, you know, you doing anything this weekend? We need a drummer. I said, no. About mm, maybe a year preceding that, our band, the Overnight Low, had the occasion of playing with the Ohio players at a place called the Lakeview Palladium. Lakeside got their name off that location because they used to call that whole area Lakeside. And at the Lakeview Palladium, it was a concert hall. It was the first time I'd ever gotten a chance to see the Ohio players. I had heard about them. We were, the Overnight Low was a group that was touring in the tri-state area, which means Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio in this area. And I had heard about the Ohio players, knew of them being, and had listened to some of their recordings, but had never gotten a chance to see them. And uh, at this occasion, going to to play at the uh, if the place, I told my wife, who's my wife today, I told her, I said, you know, you know how you get a little cocky. I said, we're going to wear this band out, you know. <laughs> we're going to do our thing. We're going to wear them out. I had heard about this band. I said, yeah, but they don't know about the overnight low. Okay, so we get up and we do our thing. And then the Ohio players came up, and uh, they just mopped us. I mean, they they <laughs> took us. It was worse than Joe Frazier. Okay, they beat us <laughs> like dog. I mean, they stopped when they came out with the capes and the and the steps and the lights flashing and the women crying and the, it was like this is crazy. And I said that night, I told my wife, I said the the band is absolutely fabulous. I can't, I can't, you know, I can't deny that. And I said, but the drummer, and, and we're, we're friends. I said, he played a shuffle with that band all night, and the band played funky around him. I said, if I ever get a chance to play with this band, I'm going to take his job. Now, back to where Marvin called me. He said, Diamond, are you busy for this week? I said, no, Marvin, I'm not busy. And I told you, Greg Webster was the leader of the band. Well, when they let me sit in that weekend with the Ohio players, he never came back. Wow. And wow. I, everything I knew, plus, and they said, Diamond, it, it, my name wasn't Diamond then. They said, Jim, just slow down. You got the job. <laughs> they fired him in the hospital. Wow, really? That's a little heavy. That'll be in my book. It's a great story. He went to the band I was in. He went to the overnight low. I went to the Ohio Players. That's crazy. That's an amazing story right there. Is that a crazy story? That doesn't really happen too often in this business, if at all. Um, now, but the Overnight Low continued in their recording. In fact, they did something like Flick My Beck, and, they, you know, they did their recordings. And, and at that time, Chet Clarence was still with them. 
And I, of course, went on with the Ohio Players. Now Marvin and myself being of that band called the Overnight Laws with the Ohio Players. And after about an album or two, we, we called Chet and Clarence, and we say, hey, Clarence, you, you know, it's Sugarfoot had been putting two parts on these on these recordings. We really need another guitar player to hold this this rhythm thing down on this guitar. You know, I mean, you want to come over with the band? And after a while, it took him a little while, but he said yes, and uh, he's been with us ever since. So that that's how I got in the band. What a great story. You're a wonderful storyteller, too. That's a great gift. 1974's Skin Tight also featured Jive Turkey, Heaven Must Be Like This, the incredible keyboard groove of Streak and Cheek to Cheek. Um, you're co-credited, as everybody is, with, with the songwriting of these tunes. How involved were you in the creation of things like Skin Tight? If you can share some stories about coming up with these songs that really, not only were the songs uh, revolutionary in their tightness, but the, the quality of the production that you guys achieved was like Steely Dan slash Pink Floyd in terms of the level of just in, uh, the, the high quality aspect of the recordings. I tell you, it was, that was one thing that we kind of pride ourselves in is that, and we were kind of headstrong into the point where we wanted to do everything ourselves. Now, at that period of time, you know, Motown was strong and going galore right up the street. And we were initially with that record company called Westbound, who was also in Detroit. But we wanted to produce, direct, sing, play, everything ourselves, call the shots, you know, ourselves. And a little bit like Motown, um, because they were so fabulous, I just, I, I mentioned Motown again because I went to see the musical last night in Detroit. Uh, a little side note, my daughter is the associate director of the Motown musical on Broadway and nice. the National Tour. Nice. <laughs> but I went to see with through Hitsville and stuff like that, and they were... The Motown artists were very relevant to things that were going on in their lives and in the lives of people around them. Likewise were the Ohio players. And Skin Tight was doing a period of time when on college campuses, as we were playing across this country, people were streaking cheek to cheek. They were wearing skin tight stuff. It was like, oh my, it was part of the love thing that was going on. Right. <laughs> Music was just absolutely wonderful, not only in our genre as far as me, but just music across the board. And the artists that, you know, that were happening at that time just writing unbelievable music. So, I mean, it was just about keeping up with pace, you know what I mean? It's like you're listening to things. It's iron sharpened it's iron, and a lot of things fell to the wayside, but we, we kind of tried to stand up, to, you know, and, and measure ourselves up to the mark, and the mark was quite high at that time. I mean, did I say incredible music? When you say Stevie Wonder and Aretha Franklin, and, and of course all the doo-wop groups that were out before us, it was just an incredible period of time. The writing, the songs, the melody lines and, and I think Billy Beck who became a part of our group right after Junie Morrison left and myself had been very well trained in music and musicality and all the emotions that, that music should present and in its formality as far as in the musicality as, as far as it breathing and having retards and having fortissimos and and having pianissimos where things are very quiet and just being able to be very musically expressive is the environment that we grew up in and a lot of it had to do with me being in the all city orchestra and band more so the orchestra because as a percussionist in the orchestra you just count a lot of measures and listen to the music, most of which is strings. So you you get a real appreciation of, of real nice music and melodies. And so we tried to incorporate that in our music. We tried to use subject matters that were not atypical. You know, we didn't write, shake your booty, feel this, feel that. We wrote songs called Contradiction, Little Lady Maria. You know, I want to be free. Who writes songs with the title, I want to be free? Heaven must be like this. It was more atmospheric. Streaking cheek to cheek is a definite expression of what was going on around this country. And so we just tried to put those type 
thoughts in music. And some have said that we, we you know, did pretty well with it. Uh, you certainly did. And like I said, the sound quality on those records is, uh, is undeniable all these years later. And you mentioned a couple, I mean, I, and we'll get to it later, but I want to be free. The, the, that's a very atmospheric. It's like, these are very contemplative songs. The years later, maintain that. Um, not only is it nostalgic, but the the sonic uh, quality of it is is nothing sort of, of admirable. You mentioned the um, the stage presentation that you saw and witnessed when when you were opening for the OP and and the way they hit the stage with a show and an intensity. I wonder how much. Because when one looks at the history of these bands and Parliament Funkadelic at the time, I guess it was it was more Funkadelic. How much did that and what George had been doing, George Clinton? How much had that influenced the Ohio players? I think everybody influenced one another. It's like if you saw on the show last week where you know this group was doing something, playing a lick or whatever, whatever. When they went around, you was playing a lick. You know, <laughs> it's like you try to incorporate what works, and you you know it's about trying to figure it out everybody at that point uh, had shows everybody put on a show even a band was not just a performance it was a show i think the influence that the shy lights and the dramatics and the stylistics and and all of those groups had influence even on bands because they were out there giving a show in most cases the bands behind those doo-wops would just play They'd be in the shadow just playing, and the doo woppers would be the steppers. Right. But then, when you saw a band like the Shy Lights band, they gave just as much as the show as the Shy Lights did. And it was like, hmm. Now, they were more of an influence on the Ohio players than very possibly George Clinton. George Clinton had a style of funk that was undeniable. And... I don't want to say easily duplicated, but it could be duplicated. But George Clinton was a show. He put on a show more or less with an array of all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, you know, it was like the circus was full here, okay, as far as what was going on there with costuming and, and personalities and hairdos and whatever, and even the environment, the fragrance of the environment, it was all a circus there going on. But the Charlotte, they had that classy type vibe about them with their performance and also the band. So I think we more or less generated in that vein right there to have more of a show that was a classy show and not to be so extraordinary with either our costuming or the things that were going on on, on the stage. And what were some of the, uh, that's a great, great explanation for it too. Um, and I just, I guess I point to that because there was such a rock sound to the songs and arrangements that you guys had. It was just, it was decidedly funk, but it had such muscle. And, and that's why in my mind, as someone who grew up with rock and then was introduced really to the funk through, through George's hard rocking kind of fusion that he brought, that was one of the reasons I gravitated to the OP as well. Who were some of the bands, Diamond, that you guys toured with or shared the stage in that early 70s era that just bills that when you look back at it, you're like, wow, those were incredible days. Almost Bill Graham-esque in the, the magic that was created through the incongruity. Well, I, you know, you can't, you can't share a stage and, and, not, and not mention the fact of, you know, the king of soul, you know, James Brown. And we did that several times with him. And there was absolutely <laughs> magic everywhere, you know, when you're on there with James. But some of the other bands, you know, New Birth. We used to have great times with New Birth back in the 70s, an incredible band uh, similar to ours, big band, horn section or whatever. But we also had great, you know, George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelics. We had great times with them. Cool in the Gang, Commodores. We really... I mean, during the period of time where, where Marvin Gaye went across the country and did, I don't know, 40, 50 dates, we were very fortunate to do 20 of them, co-starring for Marvin Gaye, and that was a treat. Never had I seen a person in my life. I used to try to come home and emulate him, how he would open up his arms and people would fall down and pass out. I said, how does that happen? What is he doing? What is the deal here? I mean, Marvin was unbelievable. And as an artist, incredible. Of course, you know, I had some fun to see him because Marvin was a drummer likewise. 
and he happened to give me a compliment one night, not knowing it was it was I he was talking about, which was great. But he was unbelievable. So those kind of nights and shows, we open up the Superdome. In New Orleans, we were the first show to open up the Superdome with the Jackson 5. Wow. We had 80,000 or so. The first show to have an R&B show at the Superdome, uh, the Wild Players was part of that bill. Another great night. It's so many, you know. Uh, we we were over in London and took over number one on the pop charts and, at Hammersmith Odium and had Elton John there to congratulate us. We had taken over his spot. Uh, another great, fabulous night that I always remember. So it, it's a lot of them. Oh, I can imagine. That's huge. Any, any. Um, I mean, The Godfather. Let, let's just skip back to that for a moment. Did he give you words of encouragement ever? Did, do you remember him watching the show from the side of the stage? Any stories with James? Anything that comes to mind with, with The Godfather? I got a funny little story. The last show we did with The Godfather, it was in uh, Indiana, and we were on stage, and James was on the side of the stage. And I come off the stage, and James said, Diamond. I said, what? He said, man, why do you play Brick House? I said, James, because that's the Commodores. He said, damn sure we is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, James, that's not us, okay? <laughs> but uh, it was just great seeing James even at that period of time in his career. Was he doing Hell or the Payback? Which of the records was he um, doing? Yeah, he was doing Payback. Yeah, and he had he had these guys out there. Just, I mean, slamming the band is always slam, you know. Maceo and Fred yeah, Maceo out there. And the guys, come on, man, you know. And Clyde uh, starts. Uh, no, yeah, Stubblefield. Clyde Stubblefield just passed away, and I had an occasion to do a couple uh, drum clinics with him and Jabbo Starks, two great guys, man. And talking about being around some people you, you looked at as, as heroes. In fact, I went to Clyde's house. He invited me to his house in, in New Orleans and, and had fish and stuff sitting in his house and looking at his drum set and whatever and, and talk to him. It's just like being, you know, a little kid in a candy store. This is the beginning of the, of the funk, the way as far as a drummer's concerned, and just the nicest guys, you know, you'd ever want to meet. And uh, still doing their thing, man. But yeah, those were some shows. You you know, the, just the electricity in a place like that is just crazy. And the gig with the uh, the Jackson 5, and was that a whole tour or was that just a, the one-off gig at the Superdome? We did several of them. In fact, we had an occasion to play with Jackson 4 a couple years ago in Iowa. And we were reminiscing about things and shows that we had together. They actually came here to our hometown and went to our office at that time and went up to our office and, and shot some pool and stuff like that. And Jermaine just told me last year, he said, Diamond, I said, yeah, I said, what's going on? I was taking pictures. And he said, you know, we always wanted to be like the Ohio players. I said, what? I said, man, are you kidding me? He said, no, we always wanted to be like the Ohio players. I said, well, you did that, son. Don't even worry about that. You know, <laughs> it was just, it was great to hear. It's like, are you kidding me? You always wanted to be like us. Like, he said, man, we always wanted to be like you. You guys had an exceptional reputation. That is no surprise to me whatsoever, because a lot of people looked at you guys as so tight and had such a definitive sound. And, and what's amazing you know, when you look at a lot of bands back then, people were cranking the records so fast. It'd be just a few months after one and another one would come. As a little kid, I was, for me, as you may imagine, Kiss was the band that kind of got me into music. And every several months, they, there would be another record. It was just unprecedented. And I look at the OP chronology, and just eight months after Skin Tight's April 1974 release, you guys dropped Fire, which included classics like I Want to Be Free, one of my very favorite songs, Fire, Smoke. Uh, can you recall any stories from why it was it so quick? that? Because it almost seemed like the longevity of these periods, and this is, again, hindsight, you look back, it almost seems like the longevity of these periods could have, could have been enhanced had the records only maybe come like a year apart from each other, but instead they were just coming so quick. Well, you know, like you, you know, I was mentioning the fact that the bar was high. 
and everybody was coming out with songs quick. I mean, you wanted to stay on the charts. You wanted to be heard again. You know what? When you had a hit record, you went on the charts, you know, number one, but two or three weeks, four weeks at the most, somebody else was knocking you off because there was that many hot records out at that time. Right. You wanted to get back up there, dang it. You know, to be able to get back up there, you had to drop another record or come out with something else, you know, because it was so many records coming out at that time. And... You know, with us, it was about the flow. The band was in, you know, it's like being in the zone, uh-huh. as, these, as these ballers do, right. you know, and these athletes, especially these curries. You get in the zone where you're shooting this ball, and all you see is the hoop is as big as the daggone house, and everything you throw up is going in, and that's how it was with us. And we were, we were in a zone. We could go in the studio and not have songs, you know, pre-recorded or pre thought about and, ju- and just go in there and just start to record and come up with vibes and ideas and, and, and finish them that quick. Release an album within that period of time and, and continue to record. Um, when we were doing the, the Skin Tight album, we were playing in the evening and flying out at that night from Buffalo, New York to go into Chicago to record during the day and then coming back to Buffalo that evening to gig. And we did that for about three or four days during that period of time. It was just about, you know, just staying in the studio and, and, and loving it and, and, and producing and doing something that you love to do. You know, when it's something that you love to do, I'm sure you know this, it doesn't feel like work and you can do it as, you know, as, as much as possible. And that's what period it was for us. And so it wasn't hard. It wasn't like we were, I know artists today, they take, you know, sometimes a, a long period of time and that, deals with a lot of other things, not sometimes them being able to come up with songs, but all the other things that are behind the business. But as far as the artistry is concerned, it was a great period of time for us. Were you just so stoked when Fire, um, I mean, you talk a little bit maybe even about the writing of Fire, which is one of these, it, it embodies so much of the sound of the band, it has the... It's uh, it kind of crystallizes the Ohio players in one song. Well, you know what? All of our songs... I say not all of them, but a lot of them, 90% of them or so, are written about women. Because we're a bunch of whole gruffy guys that, you know, look like we should be out of the woods somewhere. And that's why we use women on the album covers, because we, we wouldn't sell any if we put our pictures up on there. And so it was, it was a marketing tool. But all of them, you know, were about women. When you think about fire and you think about skin tight and you think about hoochie coo and you think about sweet sticky thing, we're not talking apples and oranges here, Kitty. <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking about them. But, you know, I, again, it was, it was said, it was played very clever, particularly on, on the lyric content um, and something that maybe we should go back to, not being so blatant and leaving things to one's imagination. Um, I know when I hear songs today, and I know this is going off into a little bit of tangent here, but, you know, it doesn't leave songs. Songs don't have any room for imagination. You know, when we, we said sweet, sticky thing, and we said you just go from man to man, I just don't seem to understand why you're so very hard to tame, you sweet, sticky thing. You know, we didn't say let me lick you up and down, let me throw you on the tabletop and spread your legs. It wasn't like that. And when you see little kids singing songs like that at three or four years old, not knowing what the content is about, it's a little confusing. Uh, so at that period of time, r- radio stations would not play what radio stations are playing today. Very good point. You could not you could not curse on a record and get it played. You couldn't even make the inference that you were getting ready to say a swear word and get played. You know they didn't they weren't beeping then. They were eliminating those songs. You know, and so it's something to be said for that. But um, we just tried to write good music, good music that had a good subject matter, a story, a good hook, and a sea change, you know, something that, that's um, in most constructions of pop songs. And we tried to write very, uh, an array of different rhythms, not being the same, straight, syncopated, funky, um, pop, you know, uh, so we, we tried to take the music and just spread it around, you know, write music for, for everyone. 
that's how you write a, a song called Little Lady Maria, you know, and that's how you write a song called Far East Mississippi. Oh. Um, because you're writing songs for people in another area. And, and you know, and, and so you go down in an area like that and you get influenced by by the area you're in and you say, hey, I have to write a song about this. And, and so we did. Um, so, you know, that's that's the direction the Ohio players came out of. I like when you mentioned that about the radio because a, another facet of, uh, and it's so true because things today are very blunt and, and you wonder if it's the post-video era because videos in so many ways filled in the blanks that you're saying were nice to have, have left in music prior to that. But the, the flip side is you guys had some really incredible TV exposure. Um, looking back that, that period, there's certainly the Midnight Special um, with which included Wolfman Jack. Are, are there particular memories that come to mind from from that portion of your TV uh, experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, all of the shows were great. I mean, Dick Clark, Soul Train with Don Cornelius, are you kidding me? I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, Wolfman Jack, we did a show in Chicago one night. We were supposed to, to play one or two songs, and we just started playing one or two. And of course, the Ohio Player songs at that time, we had a notorious habit of playing grooves for a long time. In fact, Skin Tight had seven tracks on it, and the record company had to tell us that we had to include more songs because seven wasn't, you know, the length of the tracks were too long. And our our idea of writing long tracks as far as the, the time length was, well, if we get a DJ to, to drop the needle on this rascal, it'll be hard for him to pick it up, and we want to get as much time on the radio as possible. <laughs> You know, it was like, why write a daggone two-and-a-half-minute song when you can write a seven-minute song and be on the radio for seven minutes? What a concept. So that's where we went at that with Skin Titan. We had long grooves. I mean, you DJs could go out and have a sandwich, go out to the lot, smoke <laughs> your cigarette, come back, and Skin Titan is still grooving. What a concept. And um, so, you know, we went at things like that with that, with that type theory, but... Um, I guess the reason I didn't mention Soul Train up front was because the Soul Train stuff was always lip synced, right? The Midnight Special, at least, was you guys playing it live. And that's where I was going. I'm glad you said the playing it live. We went to to, do, to record one or two tracks, and Midnight Special said, "Give them the whole show." <laughs> I don't know who else he had on the show. He said, "I'm not cutting this out. Give the Ohio players just let them keep playing," and he gave us the whole show. With this Soul Train, when you look at that, I mean, I know, and a lot, of, and people, I've talked to a lot of people, whether it's stylistics, I mean, people have different impressions of both Don Cornelius, the host of the show, but also of that kind of experience, because it was, while it gave you great exposure and was an innovative show, there was something lacking in terms of the, because it was never live, right? It was always lip synced on that show. It was always lip synced. Yes. Does that taint your memory at all, or is that just part? That's just part of the experience, and that doesn't detract from uh, how special it, it, it is in your mind. You do what you have to do when in Rome. You do as the Romans. You know what I mean? <laughs> totally. And so uh, you know you have no choice. You know now I, I have a little bit of disagreement with it today. If you go out on stage, not having to do that, of course, and you use those that gadgetry to be able to reproduce what's going on today. This band, the Ohio Players, we have 11 pieces out on, on the stage, and we're playing and singing everything. What a concept. Now, uh, for whatever reason other artists aren't, uh, maybe they'll have to address that. But, um, you know, something to be said with practice, and we do that around here just so that we can make this these songs that we've been able to be fortunate enough to write to perfect them in its uh, duplication and so um we do as as far as i'm concerned nobody can play the ohio players songs better than the ohio players i I will i will put that to test but um you know we we do we 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 try to reproduce these songs and you find a lot of artists today that were part of the 70s era that are using tracks and samplers out there today. And it's like, what is the deal here? What is the deal? 
you know, and, and you you have an audience that, that are looking at these people. I don't know, some people are being confused. Some of them just think, you know, everything's going fine. Every Everybody's singing those parts. But when there's a problem and something happens, and they have to say, we have to take it back. You don't mind, and you do this and this. Well, there's a problem. You're not doing all the, all the, all the performance. And uh, a big we problem ourselves today in being able to be a, a, a band like that today. Yeah, I can't stand that stuff. Uh, I like I played drums when I was young, and I I cannot stand artificial rhythms of any kind, and completely get um, what you're saying because it just to me that's a, a huge violation of, of the expectation of the fan. But different, like you were saying, when you're on TV, and that's how they do it back then. That that's just the way it is. And as you we also pointed out, different shows uh, uh, tackled live performance in a different way. Sometimes you were able to play live, other times y- you had to do it to tracks, and 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 it represented a visual side of the group that. Um, you know, your covers were so well known. They even won Grammy Awards for the covers, like 1975's Honey, that included Fop, Love Roller Coaster, Sweet Sticky Thing, Three Epics. Talk a little bit about those covers. And, and there was eventually a change, right, by the late 70s that you guys eventually, that you were not, you were included on the cover. It was almost like you had worn that bit to a point you wanted to change it. Yeah, I think, you know, well... For the most part, the, the first things that, that came out were, were done by the Playboy photographers in Chicago using Playboy models and uh, and the concept being around, you know, whatever title that the the, uh, the album happened to be. Uh, and they did a great job with the concept. We would let, let them know, you know, what we were thinking about as far as the titles. I can remember, you know, uh, after getting out of, out of college and, and recording, ecstasy album with um, the group and the next album was skin tight and i'm bringing the album skin tight home to my mom and dad <laughs> they see my face next to this woman's derriere and they said son is this how, why i sent you to college you know what i mean what's going on here? and uh, it was like yeah dad i'm real happy about you know this picture right here this is the album cover right here and this is the lady skin tight lady oh my and uh so it did cause a little bit of controversy. Um, I can remember my little daughter at that time asking my wife, Mom, is that you? And she said, Nani, that's not me. That's not me. Wow. Um, that's a great story right there. That's... Yeah, so. And it was Mr. Mean. That was the first one where yeah, you got. Yeah, Mr. Mean, we had on the suits, the right. formals right. out there. With the, the, I had a cigarette in my mouth. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. What an incredible! Uh, I could talk to you all day. Hopefully, when you're in town, may, maybe we could. Uh, is, is, would that be all right to get together, do a little follow up uh, when you get when you get to Honolulu? Because I could, I just love talking to you, Diamond. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, could, I could be a jabber jaw here. You, you know, and most of what I told you is a lie. I want you to say that right now. Yeah, yeah because <laughs> it's all false. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you got my cell number, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm working. Uh, actually, yeah, I do have your cell, and I'm working through the promoter to try to set up something the day before your gig to come over to the, uh, the hotel and record a thing with you. Okay, all right. Which, well, just give me a call. Which, uh, thank you. It's an incredible history um, that, that you've got. Aloha, this is Diamond Williams from the Ohio Players. We are on fire with our friend Dave Lawrence. But don't get stuck in the honey. It's time to get skin tight and make a pledge. We support all things considered on Hawaii Public Radio. You're an animal. I'm giving you a huge hug and uh, another high five. Did you have fun talking? Did I ask reasonably interesting stuff? Yeah, man, you asked very reasonably stuff. And it was very interesting, okay? And um, I enjoy talking to you likewise, all right? I look forward to seeing you when you come to town, and uh, we'll hook up and we'll record another thing. And, and God bless you, brother. You have great memories, great storyteller, and uh, huge right. legacy. I'm, I'm, I'm still moved by the music today, especially songs like uh, I Want to Be Free. So. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you likewise, all right? You be well. You too. Travel safe. You. Aloha. All right. Bye. Bye.